and we are live. Uh, <laughs> I know I promised the top of the hour, but we're going to give people a couple of minutes for the little live notification to pop up on your screen so you can run on over to Facebook or YouTube or wherever you follow these and uh, catch our little Halloween get together. This is a tete a tete with me and Rain Corbin, who you probably don't know yet, but you're going to, and I'm sure you will know their voice. Uh, so a little while ago, I wrote and released a uh, an interesting experiment. It's called Lonely House, and it's a it's it's a haunted house story, uh, but it's not just any haunted house story. I also write games and I really enjoy writing role-playing games. And in the past few years, it's become, uh, there's a new type of game that like really grabbed me and it's a journaling game. Like the idea of a solo role-playing game where you can engage at your own pace and in your own time and like really immerse yourself in the story. And for me, stories are why role-playing games grab me. Like digging into a character and living a little snapshot of their lives and letting that inspire me to tell these deep tales in whatever direction I want to take it in. Um, and there's nothing more uh, inspiring than doing that like around a table with a bunch of other people where you can collaborate with. So I wanted to capture that with Lonely House too. Uh, it came out on Itch.io and a couple of other things in just a, a PDF format. <clears throat> and I thought, what if what if for accessibility, for mood, for atmosphere, what if we could do this as an audiobook? So, Rain, who uh, I met Rain in the way that many neurodivergent people first meet one another through the written word. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I was invited to write the introduction to uh, a trans anthology. Uh, your Body Is Not Your Body uh, by Tenebris Press. Uh, it was nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award this year, uh, which was pretty darn cool. And one of the most memorable stories in there was written by Rain. And of course, I rushed right out to the social medias and was like, I need to follow this person and tell them that they were awesome, uh, which I did <laughs> in the way that I do. Uh, and just found out that Rain's a lovely human and also did voiceover work. So I filed that away. Because <laughs> uh, there's nothing better in my world than like finding people who are just awesome human beings and then being like, hey, want to make some money and work on a project? Let's hold each other up. <laughs> like, right. I, I like lifting people up. So uh, do you want to <laughs> talk a little bit about yourself? After sure. I Hi. Intro. Yes, uh, my name is Rain. I am indeed a voice actor specializing in uh, audiobooks. I do mostly horror and romance and especially love where those two things sort of cross and overlap and interweave. And uh, especially the ones where you don't know whether it's mostly romance or mostly horror until where you're a good hundred pages into it. Um, as Michelle was saying, I do, right, as well. Um, and it's such a funny way to meet somebody because um, there are so many amazing stories in that anthology. Um, mine is the ugliest, just meanest, spirited, nastiest thing I had ever written at the time. And having somebody just be like, oh, no, no, that's that's what I meant. Uh, like, that's that's clearly a good person in there. It was uh, <laughs> it's a wild way to wild way to meet somebody and then uh, begin a collaboration. But um like, yeah, like no, that anthology is is wild. I really just can't yeah. recommend it highly enough. And I feel fine, like, shamelessly, brutally plugging it because there are mm -hmm. so many stories by other people. And uh, anthology, the, the profits are all going to various trans charities. So yeah. Matt and Alex at Tenebris are really doing some cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I, anytime I get a chance to give them a shout out because they're just awesome. Also awesome yeah. people at some point I'd like yes. to. Actually, um, Lonely House was on the table. I was on the fence of like, do I submit it to Tenebris or do I just solo it? And I wasn't quite sure which to do. And because it was such a doesn't fit into any neat box project, like really breaks a lot of molds. It's not just genre blending, but it's blending different ways that we access media because um, it's a book, but it's a game, but it's a journaling exercise, but it's it's this thing. Um, I figured it would probably be safer to just do it myself and see what happened. 
Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it is it is so interesting. I mean, I know we're gonna get into it. I uh, yeah, it's it's been really really fun uh, doing the audio version of it, and I think there's so much there's so much interesting stuff happening with with the idea of choice and uh, what your what your choices mean, and especially. Like it is, it is really towing that interesting line where it's not you know, like because I'm also from a, a tabletop background. I'm just I am a forever DM, have been since high school, and I'm always thinking pretty uh, pretty consciously about like not just what choices I I want my players to go through, but like what does that mean? What is what is the point of all of these choices? What are the stakes for the the person who exists after the story? And like my gosh, you've got some you've got some really cool stuff in there. <laughs> I, uh, I hope people check out. Uh, let's see, we've got Lonely House is a really unique blend of novella and solo role-playing game. Who do you think it'll appeal to mm. most? <laughs> Gamers, readers of sci-fi or mystery, journalers, all of the above, why? I mean, all of the above, yes, of course. Um, I think I think it really is just like that, as I was saying, that that idea of of really thinking about what it means to make choices in the, in the game and over the course of it. Because it's... Um, Format wise, it is uh, it's got elements in common with sort of a choose your own adventure story. Um, but when I was playing it through in preparation to to, to work on the, the audio aspect of it, I just sort of pretended for a minute that I had no professional interest in this in this project. I just played it. I've invented a character for myself and played through it. And I made it through the, like my character's choices led to an ending that was a lot, there were a lot of pages left that had not <laughs> happened yet. And I was just like, oh, and there, it, it really, I think that people who are thinking about, uh, about choice and participation in fiction and literature, like the, just that idea that, you know, you, your you can choose for your adventure to end with that with the book at, at at many opportunities, which is true of all books. Really, <laughs> you can throw the book across the room if you're just not having a good time. <laughs> um, and I think that sort of uh, yeah, I remember thinking like, is that like that's both a game choice and mm. a book choice as well that I thought was was really cool. Um, so certainly, like I think tabletop role players uh, would have a great time with it. Um, I I think it would be. Uh, what I was thinking as well while I was working on the audio of it, um, but sort of having a, I can imagine people in in physical space uh, putting the record on, so to speak, and and doing a sort of group version and then comparing notes whenever it was done. That would be um, so cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. One of the reasons I wanted to do an audio book with it was, like, when I read through it, you know, stepping back from like I created this. There's a point where I just enjoy reading it without having to like step out and write things down, but just like at those prompts, like just kind of like dream what might be going on and then just keep going and let sort of all the possibilities kind of hang around here. Yeah. Yeah. That is, yeah, that's, that's really cool. I, yeah. What is that? I mean, what, what's your relationship with it after having written the thing and it's out in the world? Like has, has, have you gotten any feedback that has made you think about it as, as the person who did do that. <laughs> well, uh, there were a lot of things on my mind when I when I dove into this. So, you know, I write traditional fiction and nonfiction, and I've I'd hit a slump with fiction particularly because we're at this point where if you are if you are a person who lives on the internet and like really kind of keyed into our evolving culture, uh, you're aware that people are very sensitive about representation. Like like we're making a lot mm -hmm. of realizations that people uh, that we usually see in our media don't fit everyone. Um, and as somebody who's intersex and queer uh, and, uh, you know, just my brain doesn't work like everybody else's brain, like I'm aware of that to some extent. So I wanted to create, I realized in making a main character anywhere, you have to make choices that are going to exclude things. So how do I create a story that allows for the widest possible chance of someone seeing themselves in the story? At which point something that is like a open-ended was the only option where like you are a self-insert character. Uh, and then how do I write a story that allows for the broadest possible thing? And that seems to have been successful. The, most of the feedback that I've gotten from people has been um, that they could just be 
exactly who they were or what they wanted to see in a character with the story. Uh, I made a point of not having any gendered pronouns anywhere, um, not only for the main character, but for like, you know, uh, a delivery person comes up like, like it's all open-ended. So however you want to populate the world with your imagination, that's up to you. Uh, I left out like physical descriptors uh, to the, like as, as broadly as one can um, and talking about a person interfacing with the world. Uh, you know, they, they have two hands because they are grabbing things. They, they can see to some extent, they can hear to some extent. Um, mm. But the, the rest of that is sort of like open-ended. Uh, and, you know, that it started as an experiment, but I really loved the way it sort of freed up the story to evolve around the negative space of this open-ended mm. protagonist. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, uh, 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 at least, you know, we, we begin the story with a sort of a haunted house milieu. And I think that that's like, there's so much uh, that's, it's, it's such a great balance of like, that's where it's familiar enough that we know roughly the, the, the ballpark of what we're doing here. But then it's almost like the so much it's it uh it prompts so much imagination and exploration not just of the in the house uh while you're actually sort of playing the letter of the game but like exploring what that all what that means to you for your character that you've created as well because that's um it's going to be different for everybody i think and uh, and the same person uh one time after another as well um yeah i think it's it's just that 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 idea of exploration and, and open endedness, even when there is a uh, the, the the page says there's an ending, that that you've got the prompts, you put the prompts in there to be like, and what happens next? Which I, I don't think of that very often in most games. So, you know, I don't think of like I'm doing what happens after I've gotten the bummer ending of a video game or whatever. Yeah. Uh, like I don't I don't think about that because I'm doing it. But um, yeah, I think that. And then overlapping that with journal with journaling, which sort of per that last question, that's really it's a world that I uh, I am completely uh, it's totally foreign to me. But I would I would love for uh, journalers to see how what you know what's what's the haunted house journal version. Um, mm. how, how does that play out? I'd be so curious. Uh, tell us more about the format of Lonely House. If someone hasn't read it yet, what will they encounter? <clears throat> so. The, there's a preamble for the game that basically gives you an idea of like, this is what this is about, uh, and this is what to expect. And if you have uh, like areas of trauma that you really don't want to engage with, you know, there, there is a reference to like childhood bullying. There are references to small, tight, enclosed spaces. There's a uh, dream, sort of a slipstream dream thing where you're not always aware of uh, what, are you awake? Are you asleep? You're not really sure. Uh, so it sets the stage of here are the boundaries within which you're going to be playing and also introduces people who are brand new to the idea of role playing. Like what is a character? How do you make a character? Here are some prompts for that. And Raiden does a fantastic job just reading through that in a way that is still engaging and like really catches you and draws you in. Uh, so you can, you can listen to all that or you can just skip ahead and just dive right into the story and let it happen. Uh, and, what happens with the story is it's it's in sections and whenever there is a significant narrative choice a plot point where your character would make a decision that would affect the rest of the story it pauses and asks you how do you feel about that what's going on and also gives the option to be like you know what my character would say nope <laughs> yeah, those haunted house things where you're like yelling at the screen, going, "Nope, nope, 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 nope." nope. <laughs> what What the hell just happened? Nope, nope. So you have the option to write the story and end it of like, and I was the one who lived because I just got the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also wrote it. Um, so it's it's obviously if you're familiar with like Shirley Jackson, um, Chuck Wendig, like there's a certain haunted house genre. So it. it builds on the atmosphere of that trope, but I like things that cross genres, that blend genres. So as you dig into it, this is a story that could go into psychological horror, cosmic horror, it could be science fiction, it could be about time travel, like there's all sorts of different directions it could go, and it's written in a way that like allows for that modular approach of this is where you 
the person who is engaging with this as a collaborative story uh, decide it needs to go. There's a lot of House of Leaves in this too. <clears throat> like, I don't think I, I could leave out House of Leaves. <laughs> Rain, were there any especially yeah. memorable moments when you were recording Lonely House? What were they? I mean, the so the ending is fantastic. I, I definitely recommend to anyone who uh, does pick it up and play through it, um, you know, play it however you want, of course. But if one of your uh, playthroughs does lead to the ending, I think that is... Uh, that is really a, a special moment in, in interactive media for me. Um, I think really the biggest thing overall was the gradual evolution of the narrator voice, which the whole, the whole book is spoken is in the second person. I'm saying you do this and then this happens. What do you want to do now? Um, and even though it's not, uh, you know, the, the changes in the voice and, and the performance are not, it's not completely like it's not turning into, into demons unless, you know, unless that's what you want to happen. Um, but uh, the the change that happens from the beginning to the end is it it reflects to me that there is a degree of conversation happening between the narrator and the player, even though, of course, I am not you know I'm not getting anything back as I'm re recording because it's uh, you know it's a static piece of media. But I really remember uh, I did a lot. I scrapped a lot of takes for this project actually, because I would just, I would listen to it and I'd be like, no, that was, that was the same as the last chapter. It sounded the same. Yeah, and and like, I need to be up. going with this person who's investing this character's life potentially um, in this. And so I, that was completely new to me. Like even amongst audiobooks, even amongst uh, stories that I've done that were in second person, just moving through it and, and really understanding that, the player can choosing to continue uh, deeper into the story, whichever of the stories is, is happening. Um, I need to, I need to match that. I need to, and I need to be with them. And if we're in a smaller space, I'm talking, if I'm talking to a single person to you in a smaller space, then we're, we're, we're going to be a little bit closer just because we're, we're tied up and things like that were, it was so exciting to me to, to do that where I think for the most part, with many exceptions, but uh, for the most part, I think even horror audiobooks, there's a desired sort of invisibility of the narrator voice where it's, you know, the characters can sound like characters, but there has to be, uh, you have to sort of vocally pick a font for the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the narrative voice and being not just freed from that, but really like having room to play with that was, uh, was that's that to me was just that was like a boot camp of like <laughs> oh I can I can I can really do what like a lot more <laughs> than uh, than I thought was sort of within the rules yeah <laughs> no that was that was fun it was challenging to figure out like how do I give direction for what I'm aiming for with this like I've directed photo shoots and fashion shows yeah. <laughs> and music videos uh, but, but but like a voiceover an audiobook this is my very first audiobook that I've been directly involved in I believe. The Dictionary of Demons, weirdly, uh, somebody did an audiobook of the D Dictionary of Demons. Like, it's literally just like 1,700 names and definitions. It's like reading a dictionary, but good honor. Um, so technically, that's, <laughs> um, but really, this feels like this is the first one that I've been involved in. And what I wanted, what I felt was necessary with this story was to start with a sort of like every person uh, voice where the narrator voice was not going to break immersion, but then pulled you in. And then very gradually, chapter to chapter, section to section, just like tightened the tension and just like got a little like more intense and a little more invested and just like kept you on the edge of your seat. Uh, and you did that brilliantly, like I, without very much input on my part. I was just like the first listen through, I was like, oh, oh my God, why is this not doing everything everywhere? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I hope for. It's uh. Yeah, it really was is so exciting, and you know, I uh, audiobooks are my are my sort of my my medium at the moment, and I also like I I can't I cannot remember being conscious and not playing video games like at, at all like and and being aware of the voices uh, in that, mm -hmm. and so um, really just like getting to play with both because I've done I've done a, a, a few by which I mean count them on two hands video game um, roles in my life as well and I love those and would love to do more but just the 
yeah, that this balance of the two mediums of the, that I've got the most, just the most as a as a an audience member time in was it's it's really really cool. It's been fun and <laughs> really exciting to do. Yeah. What's your favorite video game currently? Ooh, uh, so I uh, I am I what what is called a frugal gamer. I will not buy anything until it's on sale. Um, so <laughs> I have completely <laughs> legitimate. Yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, finally, my ship came in, pun always intended, for uh, the return of the Oberdin, which I just started this week. And uh, I already know I'm going to want the Men in Black Memory Eraser to play that for the first time again. It is just, it's doing some real, speaking of narrative choices and mm. in a horror sort of uh, format, my gosh, cool stuff happening there. Um, what about you? I know you're a gamer as well. What's uh, <laughs> What are you doing? very impressed with the new Baldur's Gate, but it's also mm -hmm. very emotionally heavy <clears throat> and we're in the middle of like some wild stuff happening in the world. And I found that yeah. I didn't think it was not wild. So there is this, and it's, it's in beta, but it's a very advanced beta called Palia or Palia, depending on who you're, who's pronouncing it. And it's a game that I did not think I would like. It's literally like little cozy game, run around, gather stuff, build a house. It, romance villagers like people are comparing it to stardew valley which i never played because i'm i'm more a murder hobo kind of player like <laughs> run around, yep. kill things get stuff um sword and sorcery like there has to, usually there has to be an element of uh competition fight um uh, and this one is everything that's not that mm. hope punk the world's already ended and this is what grew up in its absence and the way the game is put together it encourages people to be collaborative uh the philosophy it portrays within this game like like the things that we play like they start to build architecture in our brain and expectations about how stuff works and how we interact with one another you can see that with toxicity that has developed over like certain things from the internet too mm. this is about like you you can give kudos to people i don't know if other games do it but like if you played with someone and you like them no no one sees it. You don't see it. I don't know what the devs do with it, but you can just be like, this person was cool as opposed to just huh. block and report because this person was terrible, but it changes <laughs> right. the way you engage with stuff because you're not only complaining, like you have the option to be like, this was a good experience. It reminds you that things can be good and kind and compassionate. And I've really dug that. Like I kind of need that right now. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I, yeah, I can't imagine. I, even though like uh, speaking of games with the, the least narrative choice and the least storytelling happening in general, I just, I can't imagine, I can't remember an, a, a time since college that like an MMO wasn't in rotation in my sort of, like, it's actually a big part of my sort of daily regulation, just like for mm -hmm. the, the world being so chaotic, just a mm -hmm. game where you any amount of time where you, if you spend 10 minutes in it, some number goes up a little bit is really reassuring when every, you know, a lot of other things can feel like you just, you pour energy into it and yet the world keeps getting harder. Um, so that's, that's definitely a thing. And I, and the toxicity has escalated in my experience, at least maybe mm. I'm just on the wrong servers, but my no. gosh, the toxicity has gone through the roof over the last, like, you know, people have forgotten how to, how to be nice. Uh, how to be how to be kind to each other. Um, there, there's a couple yeah. of MMOs. There was there was one that I really really loved. Like uh, my role playing group would play on there. Uh, it was called Rift Plains of Talara, and I think it still exists, but it got bought out, and it's not good. But even before it got bought out, like they didn't have. Not only did they not have robust safety tools, they really had no safety tools in place. Like mm -hmm. like the idea of like really keeping track of what how people treat other people in games is. Mm. And this got out of control badly because we were the role players. We had our little thing and, and like people would just cut like the trolls were ridiculous and nobody did anything about it because they were like, well, why are you role playing in our game? It's for PvP. And we're like, you you made this great lore. Like, who wrote the lore? <laughs> like, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or her or them. I don't care. But please give me more lore. Um, and, you know that experience with stuff. Okay, well, here, before I get on, on Lonely House is gone. <laughs> okay, you can put it back up, I'll read it. <laughs> my lovely wife is helping keep us on track because she knows my brain. 
Uh, <laughs> and I'll just wander all over the place. Lonely House has gone through a really storied evolution. Tell us a little bit how it came to be this unique blend of novella and role playing. And oh yeah, that's right. So there's a novel that is uh, trunked. That is, I think, the technical writer term for it. That I wrote. Oh, it was called Dark Legacy. And I wrote it between the second and third books of uh, the Shadow Side series. So maybe 2012, maybe? I don't know. And it started off strong. Like every, th every, every beat that we see at the kind of the beginning with Lonely House is drawn from that. But then like once I would get to the house, it just trying to write it as a regular novel of like there is one set path and one end and only one end would not fit, just simply would not fit in the concept of this space that behaves the way that the lonely house behaves. Uh, and I, I picked at it and you know, the way that you go back and forth with stuff. And finally, uh, it was reading some work by uh, Jeon Shim uh, and uh, Xing Yong, Xing, oh, I'm gonna murder their names. I'm going to opt to not say it rather than be a terrible human being. Uh, there are some beautiful um, like memorabilia games, uh, keepsake games and journaling games. And they changed my way of looking at where narrative novel and game intersect. And once that sort of like blew apart my expectation and I was like, it doesn't have to be a novel. Let's just write it the way it wants to be written. Mm. And that's where this curious blend of journaling prompt and interactive experience and role-playing game and novel kind of came together. Uh, and I was, when I was done, I was like, I, I don't know what I could possibly do with this. I was like, Hey, agent who saw this first novel, this is what happened to you. <laughs> I can't do anything with this. And I'm like, yeah, I just figured you should see it. She's like, it's great. I'm like, yep, there's no market. Yep, I know, it's okay. <laughs> Sometimes you write it because that's the way the story needed to be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so off I went to Ichio <laughs> and just was like, ta-da, here's a story. Uh, and, you know, worked with my artist collaborator, uh, Abriel, uh, Kat Rogers, and was like, gussy it up and make it look kind of aged and stuff and i need like a house that looks like this and this and this and this and then i play i watched um mike flanagan's midnight club and the opening bit of the house that they've sort of pastiched together in cgi i was like do we share a brain cell because that could be <laughs> the lonely house in my head <laughs> like i was just like it's even yellow what the heck um <laughs> So I don't know what it is about yellow haunted houses, but some it, somewhere, somehow, in a certain age group, maybe, maybe it was some movie that we watched when we were too young to fully remember why it put <laughs> stuff on us. But like there is a a particular archetypal haunted house that just is there. Yeah. I feel like yellow is right on it's it's at right the exact right point on the rot spectrum of yeah, yeah. it's just like it's not quite it's not actually there's not fungus sprouting yet but it's definitely it's turned you know it's that, starting that, to sting that old healed bruise orchid has a good question how did you learn yeah. to work back for audiobooks oh uh well so i started um taking voice acting so unfortunately you have you have asked an autistic person about their special interests so uh you you you've you done goofed we're gonna be here for a minute um no, most of us but... are we're on a spectrum we're here for it <laughs> uh yeah we, so i um i first started take, paying attention to how people talk uh as a child because i moved a lot growing up um internationally because of my dad's work and uh quickly learned that uh, at first i could avoid um negative attention by learning quickly to speak the way the people around me spoke. And then uh, you can do even better than just being left alone. Like once you start getting good at impressions and all of that, um, then that's, that's, that's positive attention. So it, it's been sort of from the beginning for really as long as I've been talking, it's been a combination of um, uh, defense mechanism and it's, it's, it's a craft. And for my, the way my sort of speech stuff is set up, uh, autistically, 
uh, despite the fact that I speak for a living, uh, I, talking can be really hard sometimes. And when I'm overwhelmed and toast, like my the the speech turns off immediately. So all of that eventually led to a point of uh, when I was first paying attention to the voice acting I was listening to and really realizing that um, I've been I've been consciously voice acting since since I've been speaking more or less. Um, and I took a great voice acting class when I still lived in Los Angeles with uh, the voice actor Crispin Freeman. He's, he's, he's huge. He's a really uh, he's a guy. He's doing he's doing some big stuff. Um, and in that, it was a great class about archetypes. And I learned a lot of specific character types that uh, I could be interested in and th that I was good at. But really, the thing that I kept finding myself coming back to was just the how quickly I noticed people tapping out that it was you couldn't do more than um, sort of 10, 15 minutes of focused acting, whereas I was sort of pulling from a longer experience of of having the stamina of talking for a long time intentionally, basically voice acting and realizing that. And of course, I just I love books. I've always been surrounded by books in my entire life. Uh, and so that really struck struck me as the place that I my both my stamina at being able to talk for a long time intentionally matching a rhythm and a voice that I uh, I was uh, the one I hoped was coming out of my mouth. And then just, I mean, I, I love, I love books and I love book people. I love working. I love that all my clients are creative people to begin or are artists uh, who are invested in their own, um, in their own words as well. Um, and in terms of, of learning how to do it, it really was a, a lot of just reading books out loud to myself, um, recording it, going back over it. And then um, I went on acx.com too early uh, before I was actually good enough to be doing uh, any voice acting or um, any audiobook narration. And the thing about that is that you can find real auditions with relatively low, you don't even have to submit them, but you can see what people are really auditioning for and, and booking and practice that way. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it really is uh, as much as I, cause I'm, I'm such a dilettante. I love to spread out and try all sorts of voice acting, all that, but I love that this is, this is an area that I feel so at home with. And I love that it feels luxurious to be able to play characters for, uh, you know, the month that it takes to do a whole novel like that. Like I really, it's such a gift from, from the authors and, uh, and as a performer to really just get that time with the 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 role and the mood and the story and that's uh yeah that's that's the shortest i've got <laughs> i mean hooray for being able to use hyper focus as like a superpower <laughs> yeah yeah um, well, thank you for that question that was great yeah. where are some of the places people can see the other stuff you've done because i i definitely like what one of my sneaky reasons yeah. for doing this is like please discover this awesome person <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, yes, uh, most of my work is on Audible at the moment uh, for audiobook narration uh, under Rain Corbin. It is mostly that is so I have two identities on online for my my narration. Rain Corbin is the mostly horror side of things. And then Richard Pendragon is the romance and uh, spicy stuff, uh, which uh, if you are related to me, erase the last five seconds from your memory forever. It never happened. Um but uh, and both of them are, you know, it's it's the interplay. Like it, what I love is how many of my projects I'm just like, I don't know which guy to which guy to be for this one, because they're they're close. Um, I would I would always say with the horror stuff, uh, use your best judgment with uh, not all of the horror will have content warnings. And, um, mm. you know, plenty of it is plenty of it is out there to, to be a bad time. So uh I'd say I always want people to be safe more than than buying my stuff. But uh, <laughs> there's a lot of really great, uh, a lot of really great queer horror happening as well that I've been I've been very lucky to get to lend my voice to. Well, I think a lot of horror writers, especially old school horror writers, sort of feel that mm -hmm. like the content war warning is in the genre title. Like it's right, horrible. terrible things are going to happen. It's sort of like right. if you're reading murder mysteries, somebody's gonna die. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, for sure. Natural causes and comfortable. 
Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think especially the the extreme horror, the splatterpunk stuff, like, you know, uh, unless you don't know what that means, it's it's absolutely boundary pushing. Um, and yeah. so, so some caution. Yeah. Well, like, like your body is not your body is body horror. Um, oh, and yeah. really leans into not just like physical areas of discomfort, but like mental, like dysphoria, like, because it's a trans anthology, like that's a theme there. Uh, and so like, I'm always like, Okay, so there's this awesome anthology, and also, like, you have to be in the right space to want to read that. It's a little bit like uh, some of Cassandra's co uh, Cast Cause stuff, which is brilliant. Yeah. Or, uh, God, uh, Stephen Graham Jones. <sighs> oh, my God. Bowlers, yeah. teeth, antlers, going to be stuck yeah. in there forever. Um, yeah. Also, pillowy. Thank you, Chuck Wendig, for ruining that word. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I... <laughs> It's funny because it like as soon as you said that, I hadn't placed it. I, I just something like a little kill bill light started happening mm -hmm. in my mind. And then when you said Chuck yep. Wedding, I remembered. Yep. Oh dear. Yep. Or like right. cold well. roast beef, cold roast beef, lady fingers, lady yep. fingers. Girl. I, I read yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, lady fingers. Once. Oh god. I think I was 12. I have never forgotten it. It is yep. in my head forever. All right, new question. Do you think a <laughs> sequel to Lonely House is a possibility? Are there plans to continue the story or offer new formats? Or is it a standalone tale? I think that Lonely House as such is a standalone tale, but I think the style of story is not necessarily like a one and done. Like this is something I want to play with again and a format I want to play with again. It's just finding... The reason I think Lonely House works is it starts with things that are very familiar and immediately immersive. There is a house. Suddenly you are its owner and you don't know a whole lot about it. What happens next? And like, that's a fairly standard, that's, that's every haunted house story ever. You know, usually like you inherit this thing, like somebody passes away, suddenly you have this house. You've never really like, maybe you lived in it a long time ago, but like, you're not familiar with it. And the house itself is an entity. And that's a part of that particular style of story. So I'd need to find a style of story that engages similar familiar things in order to then just like shatter them and take you into weird, weird places. Uh, I did that a little bit. so. There was a sort of journaling game, like it, it, it's a journaling game, but it's much more like a straightforward, this is a journaling game with prompts called Midnight, Midnight's Kiss, I'm talking about spicy. Um, and it is my vampire romance story. Uh, and it is uh, LGBTQIA kink poly, like every possible thing. I wanted to be able to create a romance story that you could do with as you pleased based on what your particular tastes were, as long as those tastes also included vampires. <laughs> and it's <laughs> uh but it's much more just a standard like here's like a paragraph to set the stage here's another paragraph to say like this is what's going on and then like here are your journal prompts so much more what you would expect when you engage with a journaling game as opposed to this novel like like this is there's whole chapters that like you're reading a book uh knowing my proclivities writerly wise it would probably be a vampire story next if i did something but i'm not sure like it i think only certain stories want to be in this format in my head i don't know pretty sure i'm not that makes that. that makes a lot of sense too i think that the the sort of uh do you want to do you not want to of vampire stories makes a lot of sense for an interactive story that would yeah. uh yeah well, yeah, like, is this a romance or is this horror? And, like, the right. appeal of vampire romance is you're not always sure. Like, this is somebody who could, in yeah. fact, just eat you for dinner. Right. Uh, and historically, the vampires that really titillate are the ones who are still monsters and they know it. Mm -hmm. You just happen yeah. to be, like, their favorite food animal. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. That they somehow manage to relate to. Uh, so yeah, I, a vampire one probably is not off the table, but nothing has grabbed me yet. But that's partly because I, I'm a person who, I have not been diagnosed with ADHD or any of those things, but like my IQ is at a point where like, I'm inevitably neurodivergent. Like I cannot, I, I do not think like other people. <laughs> um, and that's not like a brag that's a like my brain does not work like other people's brains so i have to try to figure out how to work around people and talk to them 
Um, so I am always juggling like 15 to 30 different projects in different stages of done based on sort of where my head is at. Uh, and these days, a lot of that has been little games, uh, but also decks of cards for prompts. Most, there's usually a theme and the theme of the past couple of years has been choice things where the person engaging with it has the most lately like the broadest possible boundaries within which to work uh, to shape their engagement in a way that is most comfortable for them. Uh, so broadly speaking, these sorts of experiences, like when people are like, what is Lonely House a game? Is it a book? And I'm like, it's, it's a collaborative experience. I'm not sure what else it's also why audiobook made so much sense because you're experiencing it much more immersively that way. You can just cue it up and just let it happen around you. Um, probably not done with it, but that particular story, I think, I, I don't see a sequel. Partly because I don't know how it ends. Only you get to figure out how it ends. So Rain, how did your experience narrating Lonely House compare to your experience narrating other books' stories? And I know you touched on this, but yeah, yeah, it's it's funny as, as you were talking about that about about the choice in games. I hadn't realized that one. I because in my mind, I've got some influences about my voice, uh, the the voices and sort of the general narrative posture from that book. Uh, but the one that I hadn't, did you ever like in the nineties, there was a, a, a board game that came with a VHS that you would stick in the, in the, ta in the tape player. And um, you and four people, you'd, you, I think it was called atmosphere F E A R mm. and you'd move around the board. And then the tape was mostly ambiance, just like smoke and spooky music and like, you know, bats and Ravens and stuff. And then every once in a while, this guy would come up, this Crypt Keeper type of character would pop up and be like, whose turn is it? Stop! Go back three <laughs> places. And this scared the absolute snot out of us as kids. And I hadn't realized that like that sort of, that, that's, I didn't know that that was in my mind uh, until this conversation about it, but that guy was there. And mm. I think that like that really that that interactive thing is is what made it different from anything else um because it's interactive in a way that while um you know if i were doing a similar thing for a video game it's still done but i i don't know that i would feel the the draw to um perform as if i know what the person's choices have been which is something mm -hmm. that, that 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 happens in this where the choice to continue um as I, as i sort of touched on the choice to continue with the story means that I need to be continuing with that person. Um, you know, and I think that the, the role sort of, rather than being a, um, cause even, even with most novel narration, the narrator is a character and I've never done the same narrator voice for two books ever. It's, it's still, and it depends on the book. Like sometimes it's, it's, it's a guy at a bar telling you, you won't believe what happened to me today. And sometimes it's something much more formal, just, you know, and, and um, it, it varies a lot. And for this one, I really think that it was, it was a way more dynamic character um, rather than one that mostly stayed static. I think that it really kept me on my toes in a way that was exciting. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it really has, I've brought that, I, th I think and hope to uh, my projects since that, um, of just really, yeah, it, it taught me a lot about uh, where we're all going together um, mm -hmm. on, on that story, which um, for books as a relatively static medium is, is not the default. And uh, that was neat as hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, trying to craft that space. Like that tells me I did, I did a good job because I, I can't, it really was okay so lonely house broke some writer's block for me because i i live well, i lived on the fight the 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 site formerly known as twitter um and so i'm like knee deep in this sort of our our cultural our evolving culture is it's almost a revolution like there's there's all of these interesting ways in which we are re-examining how we relate to identity and personality and what we call ourselves, what we call each other, um, and just really broad, but also very personal things about who's allowed to occupy spaces, who's allowed to tell stories, uh, who's allowed to have a voice. Mm. Uh, 
And like, I mean, these are issues that should have always been concerning us, but they are really in the forefront in a number of communities right now. And as someone who, I'm Gen X, you know, my, my childhood and young adulthood, like I was told, like I named myself Mickey and asked for male pronouns when I was like three. And of course I had that pretty much beat almost literally right out of me. And that's the, that's the experience of a lot of people my, my age where like, you don't get to make a choice about that. You're not allowed to do that. You have to eventually grow up and be a cookie cutter person and just accept the role that the world has given you and quit whining and expecting it to be different. Um, and heaven help you if you want to have any opportunity that people like allow for the fact that you don't function like other people. Like, like you just had mm. to suck it up, suck it up, buttercup, life's rough, get a helmet. Like all the stuff that we heard <laughs> yeah, that yeah. like now in therapy, I'm like, Oh wow. That's all abuse. That's terrible. So much trauma. No wonder we're all, all messed up. Um, but in writing stories, I, I realized like, how do I not do that? Like, how do I make room for as many different perspectives as possible? Like, I became hyper aware that in writing a story, I'm, I can only ever use my own perspective, really. Uh, everything else is me sort of trying on hats, but how do I do that authentically? And the mm. only answer that I ran into was, I can't do that. I have to put it in the hands of the person who can tell that story, which is where the concept for Lonely House came from, really, is, all right, well, here's the part of the story that I can tell you. I know about the house. I know about where it's at. I know it's quirks. In some ways, I am the house drawing you into the story about it. You, the person engaged with this, you are your own story. So where and how do these stories intersect? And that's sort of the heart of this experience. Oh, any other thoughts about Lonely House? Either would like to share uh, the release date for October 31st is not an accident. Um, it happened the last time also because I know a lot of people would be like, but October 1st, all of spooky season, but NaNoWriMo. Like if you are stuck for story ideas and prompts and things, and this is something that's going to help you get the creative juices flowing, this is the book for you. Can confirm. I uh, just in my uh, it, through my narration, uh, and this is something that I sort of I, I haven't I haven't written it down. But e while while I was narrating it, I also had a character that I was playing through sort of live. That was you know. Anyway, it is it has shaken loose some ideas. I'm working on a, a sort of a, a, a labyrinth based thing currently that it's just sort of shaken out of me. Um, so, so can confirm if, uh, if you're ever in a jam, spend a few hours in the lonely house and, uh, <laughs> see what shakes loose. Yeah. yeah. To me, good stories inspire more stories. Like they For sure. bring new things out of us and, and allow us to explore maybe perspectives we hadn't thought we were carrying around. Uh, and that's also the appeal of role play for me is like pulling out these different facets of self, uh, so many role play characters ultimately in role play worlds turn into things that are backdrops for books and stories. So yeah, come yeah. spend a little time in the lonely house, listen to the mellifluous voice of our gifted narrator, who I feel adds an extra layer of immersion to it uh, and see where it takes you. Um, and don't be afraid to share like, you know, without spoilers, but like, I would love to hear what, story you tell absolutely i i mean i would do <laughs> yeah. so that sounds so cool yeah like i i think it's it's such a there's it's so expansive and 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 i mean something i love too is that it's there's there's such a rare combination of the accountability of either the text or the voice version. I I just want people to experience the story, like sure, <laughs> whichever version works. But like the the combination of the accountability of it, but also there's there's privacy as well. Like you you don't have to you know none of us are ever oh, going to yeah. know unless you want to share. Oh, and yeah. I think that's you know there's not the sort of live pressure of a tabletop game where you know you've you've got a few seconds to decide what you want to do and then everyone's gonna gotta have opinions about it um and i think that uh yeah it's 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 really it's something else i i really i don't know i don't know much like it and i think it's i i think it's really cool it's been a real 
it's been really exciting to get to be a part of this version of it. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that maybe that is one of the reasons why journaling games have taken off because like everything is content now. And if you do anything, you're streaming, mm. but yeah. sometimes role play is like, well, for, okay. Role play is always um, emotionally intense, incredibly mm -hmm. revealing, always intimate, no matter what you're doing. And sometimes that's not something you want to share. Uh, so a game like this allows you to really lean into whatever it is and no one is looking over your shoulder. Nobody needs to see it. Uh, I would love to hear your stories, but also if those are stories that you only want to have for yourself, that's a very important place to live. And with that, with that, <laughs> We will look forward to a Halloween release of the audiobook. If you are curious, you can get the PDF and kind of pregame it. Um, but if you want no spoilers and just want to like dive into the experience, I really recommend just wait for the audiobook and then queue it up on Halloween night and just let it play. Yeah, and if, if I have one, you know, of course, it's you've got to do it how you want to do it. Um, but like, li be, feel free to actually get up and pause the thing to wait. And, and you know, yeah. I'm I'm the worst at uh, whether it's a, a sort of a worksheet or a do where I'm like, okay, I get it, I get it. Let's let's let you know. I want to progress. Resisting that, I found very rewarding uh, with this. So um, yeah, thank you so much for for every part of this process. It's been it's been really exciting. I can't wait for this to be 